Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This Day in Sports History. And welcome back to This Day in Sports History. I will be your time-traveling galactic tour guide for the next few minutes. And if there is one guarantee I can make to you here on this dish, it's that if there has been a weird sports trade, it will wind up on an episode. Whether it's an announcer traded for a cartoon character, two Yankees trading their wives, a hockey player traded for a bus, or a player traded for himself, you can count on me to bring that story to you. And of course, that lead-up is related to what happened today in 2006. Okay, so a little disclosure before I get into it. Was this more than likely just a publicity stunt? I gotta lean into a yes here, but still interesting, which is why I'm leading off with it today. This is a minor league baseball trade, and of course, minor league baseball teams are publicity hounds to begin with, and they tend to come up with funky marketing gimmicks on a regular basis. So on this day, pitcher Nigel Thatch was traded from the Schaumburg Flyers, located in Illinois, to the Fullerton Flyers in California for 60 cases of Budweiser. Now, I'm specifically saying Budweiser instead of just 60 cases of beer, because that's part of the gimmick of this trade. Thatch was 0-3 with a 10.22 earned run average in just 12 and a third innings for Schaumburg prior to the trade. That's not exactly an enticing set of numbers for other teams to add to their rotation. But Thatch was not your normal ball player. And while there are a lot of athletes that go into acting after they're done with their career, Thatch was an actor who wanted to play ball. You see, you may remember Thatch from a series of commercials he did in the early 2000s, playing Leon in a string of Budweiser commercials. His character, Leon, portrayed both professional football and baseball players and was known for lines like, Leon ain't playing unless someone is paying. By the accounts I found, Thatch was serious about playing baseball. And I mean, this is nothing against Schaumburg, Illinois. I'm sure it's a lovely place. But if you're an actor, then playing baseball in Schaumburg is not the best place to be if you want to also attend acting auditions. He expressed the desire to get back closer to home and Los Angeles. When the commissioner of the Golden Baseball League in California, Kevin Altkoff, heard that, he started working on a trade to bring Thatch to Fullerton. Anheuser-Busch was more than happy to supply the 60 cases to Schaumburg, but apparently Thatch wasn't that enthused about being traded for 60 cases of Budweiser, no matter his previous ties with the company. He was offered the standard $700 a month to play for Fullerton, but he never reported to the team. Thatch has continued his acting career, though, portraying Malcolm X in both the movie Selma and in the TV series Godfather of Harlem. Also on this day in 1983, the Baltimore Colts selected John Elway with the first pick in the NFL draft. But here's the thing, Elway did not want to play in Baltimore, and he let the Colts know that well ahead of the draft. Word was he did not want to play for head coach Frank Cush. But Colts GM Ernie Accorsi was not about to miss out on a -a once-in-a-generation quarterback like Elway, or as he kept telling people, the next Johnny Unitas. Elway was not only the top prospect in a quarterback-heavy football draft, but he was also a top pitching prospect in the Major League Baseball draft. And he told the Colts that if they drafted him with the top pick, he would play baseball instead. The Colts believed that he would eventually come around and took him with the top pick on this day. A week later, no movement had been made, and while Acorsi was standing firm and confident that Elway would come around, owner Robert Ursay had other ideas. He was not so confident, and he told his GM to trade Elway. Other teams around the league started calling Acorsi with offers, but Denver Broncos owner Ed Kaiser Jr. cut out the middleman and called Ursay directly. Negotiation started, 
and eventually the Broncos sent fourth overall pick and offensive lineman Chris Hinton, a first-round pick in the 84 draft, and reserve quarterback Mark Herman to the Colts. And that's how Elway wound up in Denver. In 1931, Lou Gehrig hit a home run, but on his way around the bases, he passed another Yankee base runner, meaning Gehrig was out, and the home run he just hit did not count. That's only significant because at the end of the year, he had a total of 46 home runs, which tied him with Babe Ruth for the major league lead. And in 2006, Kobe Bryant changed his number from 8 to 24. It was a bit of a surprise for a player who had really become synonymous with the number eight, like, say, Michael Jordan and 23. Kobe said it was part of his maturation process and the second half of his career. But there may have been another reason. Kevin Garnett said that everybody missed the real reason he went with 24. It was all about being one more than 23, one step above MJ. It was a shot at Jordan. Every record that Michael had Kobe chased, though he came up one championship short, one MVP short, and several championship MVPs short. But the switch was not a bad move for Kobe. His number 24 jersey became the top-selling jersey in the NBA the next year. And in 2006, minor leaguer Delman Young had a major league meltdown. Young was the reigning minor league player of the year at the time, playing triple-A ball for the Durham Bulls. On this night, Young took a called third strike that he thought had missed the strike zone by a good bit, and he began arguing the call. Before we go further, though, you should know there was an umpire strike going on, and the guys brought in as replacements were high school and college umps. Young wasn't interested in the umpire's CV, and he was also not interested in leaving the batter's box. As he continued to argue, he was ejected for not leaving the box, and then he tossed his bat underhanded at the ump. Eventually, tempers settled, and the game continued, but the league dropped the hammer on Young soon after, giving him a 50-game suspension. It was the longest suspension ever handed down in the International League. His bat toss also cost him $145,000 in lost salary. And in today's non-sports did you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, you know, the extremely wealthy railroad magnate, Well, he slept in a bed with the legs of that bed placed in bowls of salt in an effort to ward off evil spirits. That's all for today. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, Or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you gotta do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.